this is James Newcomb, and welcome to episode number 14 of Musicpreneur, Making Money, Making Music. Today's topic is intellectual property, and I'm going to warn you right now, if you think that intellectual property is imperative for civilization to survive, if you think that artists cannot survive or thrive without intellectual property, well, you're not going to like this episode at all. In fact, you may as well just press stop right now. But hopefully it will give you at least a little bit of clarity on what is at best a confusing topic, especially in this day and age. So let's get to it with my guest, Stefan Kinsella. Welcome to the program, Stefan Kinsella. Thanks. Glad to be here. All right. This is Musicpreneur, Making Money, Making Music, and this is a topic that I have wrestled with over the years, and I've come to the conclusion that intellectual property is a huge barrier to musicians uh, monetizing their efforts. It creates uh, a lot of problems for musicians, and I realize that by saying this that uh, a lot of people disagree with me um, or, or they just they maybe I've turned them off already but you know what I am not gonna beat around the bush anymore I tried to I tried to deal with this sort of in a backdoor way and um, I say screw it and the best person that I thought of to tackle this issue and tell us why intellectual property is a hindrance to progress and innovation is Stefan Kinsella. And he is the author of Against Intellectual Property, as well as a free PDF called Doing Business Without Intellectual Property. And you can get that PDF at musicpreneur.com slash resources. So Stefan, I want to start out with, um, I guess, the major problem with intellectual property is that it really does not fit in with the traditional concept of property as as we know it is do i have that correct yeah that's that's part of the way to look at um the problems with it um um you know i i, I think you mentioned i i'm actually a practicing patent attorney mm -hmm. um, and I, intellectual property attorney so i've done this for 24 something years um, as a as a practice as my career, I'm also a libertarian, and I've always been very interested in um, uh, property rights and justice and individual rights, and also in the creative works. You know, the the the, uh, the, the intellect. You know, the the creations of scientists and philosophers and artists and singers. So it's not like I'm opposed to these things, but just from what I've seen. In my career and in my um, studies of individual rights and property rights, um, and learning a little bit more about the history of and how these systems actually work, patent and copyright in particular, uh, I've come to the conclusion, and I came to the conclusion 20 something years ago, <clears throat> that these laws are completely incompatible with justice, with property rights. Uh, they should be completely abolished, and they do not achieve the purported functions that most people believe. People are so used to these the ideas. Artists are so used to a system that is dominated by and influenced by copyright, especially copyright. We'll talk about for musicians and for um, these kind of entrepreneurs, novelists, writers, movie, movie makers, people like that, um, that they, they feel hostile when they hear a criticism of it. They, they basically think you're insulting the creative enterprise itself right, right. they think you're because you're saying they're not worthy of having property rights uh, businessmen can have property rights in their land in their factories and buildings but um, but artists are not entitled to because they're not as important that's how they, <laughs> they take that hmm. um, but when you start pointing out all the problems that IP as a practical matter causes the average typical creative person um, they start to see, yeah, maybe this bargain is not such a good idea. Um, well, let's talk about uh, how intellectual property is not property. Uh, and the way that I understand it from what you say is that, <clears throat> like, 
Here, I'm holding a pencil right now that I'm taking notes with this interview. No one else can own this pencil. Only I can have possession of it at one particular time. Whereas <clears throat> the words that I'm saying right now, well, how can I say that I own those words? How can I say that I own this combination of words? And, and that's, uh, I, gu I guess that's where we have to start to understand uh, how the concept of intellectual property is problematic. Yeah, and look, the way I look at it, the way I've come to describe it over the years, um, uh, it's I sometimes rely upon some of the concepts of uh, basic law. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand this, and also some of the concepts um, of Austrian economics. I don't know if we need to get into Austrian economics here too much. Uh, you don't need to know the works of Hayek or Mises to really understand this. Uh, it's pretty commonsensical, but if you just understand the purpose, like step back and think about man and society, why we have laws, why we have rights, what the function of these things are, what the function of property rights are, um, you'll see why patent and copyright are completely incompatible. And just a, a patent is like a, a grant by the state that gives you basically a monopoly over the use of a given invention for roughly 17 years. Mm. Copyright is a monopoly granted by the state to be the only one who can, say, reproduce and broadcast and copy um, a, uh, a creative work like a, a novel yeah. or, or a song or, or, or a song yeah. or even even software, which was not clear for a while because software has functional aspects. So finally, the court said, yeah, this is so. So software actually is subject to both patents and copyrights and trademarks. So it's it kind of hits all the bases. Um <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so the, the fundamental thing is we live in this world, a world of scarcity. Now, by scarcity, it's an economic term. It just means there are things we want to use and we need to use to live, um, tools, land, food, lumber, things like that, mm -hmm. even your body. And this just means that only one person can use these things at a time. There's a possibility of conflict. But when humans in society see these kind of violent conflicts – some of us prefer to live in a peaceful society or cooperative one where we don't have these violent conflicts. And the only way to avoid that problem is for people to choose not to do it, which means if there's a resource or a good that can be used by only one person at a time, like your pencil, we have to assign an owner to that thing. So we have a rule that everyone in society respects, which identifies the person who has the right to use that resource. So that's just property rights. Yeah. So it's, I, if you wanted to be precise, you wouldn't say the pencil is property. What you really would say is the pencil is a resource, hmm. and you have a property right in that resource, gotcha. or basically you are the owner of that resource. The reason yeah. the word property is used is a property sort of means a characteristic, right? Yep. So when you use a pencil, it's an extension of yourself, hmm. right? Or your right. clothes, extend, it, it helps you extend your influence out into the world, and for some things that you use all the time – it might become very intimately associated with your, your very being, like your pair of glasses maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so you would say these things are a property of of that person. And then people start over time calling it it's his property. Mm. And when they say it's his property, what they really mean is it's his characteristic. But they tend to think of property as describing the object itself. The technically, I would just call the resource as a resource that's owned. So the entire property rights system, which is what the whole legal system ultimately is about, simply is there to answer the question, when there's a dispute between two or more people over who gets to use a type of resource over which there can be disputes, right? So there's some object, some thing that multiple people want to control, whether it's someone's body or someone's home or someone's pencil. The property system simply gives us an answer to that question. It says who the owner is, and then we identify the owner, and everyone goes away, and the owner gets to use it as he sees fit. And anyone else who interferes with that is then seen as a trespasser or as a criminal. Okay, So that's how property rights work. But you'll notice that that applies only to things that there can be conflict over, these scarce resources. Something like a pattern of information or knowledge that's in your head is not the same kind of resource. It's – uh, and this is where human uh, uh, Austrian economics comes into it. Under the Aust and I, I'll just say one part, one little thing about Austrian economics, not to turn off your guests, although I, I find Austrian economics fascinating. Well, I'd like to talk about Austrian economics because, um, okay. I, I mean, for us to, I mean, if we're going to tackle this issue, then we 
let's just dive into the woods. So I, how do, first of all, let's destroy, describe Austrian economics and how uh, this is uh, more or less leads to this conclusion that we're talking about. Yes. So uh, and Austrian economics has nothing to do with the economics of Austria or Australia even. I think Tom Woods, Tom Woods once had a debate about seven, eight years ago with the uh, CEO of uh, ING, the big insurance company, and uh, about the, it was about the crash or something. And um, he, this guy says, I don't know why Woods keeps talking about Austrian economics. The, the, Austria has got such a small economy compared to the U.S. <laughs> it, it, you know, and he's like, oh, Lord. So it's just one school of economics. Like there's a Chicago school, which is associated with Milton Friedman and the monetarists. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a number of thinkers and philosophers that came out of Vienna, Austria at, at, the, at the turn of the – well, around the 1900s. And they developed a distinct school of economics. Uh, it was started by people like Karl Menger and Friedrich von Wieser and then – Ludwig von Mises and Hayek. So it's, it's, it's just a different type of economics, a little bit different than the, the Chicago school. And one strand of that is the, the school founded and perfected by Mises. And Mises had a, a unique way of looking at the problems of economics, and that is he called it human action. Human action. And all he did was he – and for our purposes, we don't have to get the technical economics, but more of the framework of it or the methodology, which is that Mises recognized that humans act and that there are certain logical implications of that. And that's how he deduces his body of economic laws. But what it means to act is for a human being to look around the world and to have some conception of where he is and what the future is – what future is coming. And he anticipates some future that's coming that will happen without his intervention. In other words, something is coming, something's going to happen, and I don't like that. I'm dissatisfied by that. Yeah. And I'm aware, I'm, a, I'm aware enough of the way tools operate, the way my arms can move, the way we can intervene in the physical processes of the world that I could take an action and change things for the better. So that's all human action is in general terms. So if I start feeling hunger, I realize that if I don't procure some food, in about an hour I'm going to be very hungry, or maybe I'll die. I'll be weak. right? So that, that thought frightens me or makes me uncomfortable. So I think, well, how can I satisfy this? Well, I've eaten before, so I know I need to eat. Well, how do I eat? I have to find food. Well, how do I get food? I have to maybe make a spear and go spear some fish. So you think of things like that. Those thoughts – are informed by your knowledge of the world, your knowledge of what's possible, your knowledge of what might be coming, your knowledge of what uh, tools are available that you could possibly manipulate. And then you go out and you make a choice and you do it. So you can see there's two fundamental components to human action. All human action, number one, involves the employment of the scarce resources or means. <laughs> And number two, it's guided by knowledge. So you have information or knowledge that you, about what you think might happen in the future and about how the laws of physics work, right? How, uh, how if you sharpen a spear and throw it in the water, gravity will take it down, and if it hits the fish, it will kill the fish, and you can catch the fish, and you can <laughs> use fi fire to cook the fish, etc. So you see all human action, especially successful human action, that is an action that ch achieves what you wanted to achieve – is a combination of knowledge and employment of scarce resources. Now, the scarce resources are these things that we talked about before that could – there could be conflict over those, like only I can eat that fish. Only I can use that spear. So if a, there's another person around who wants that spear or wants that fish, and he physically takes it from me, I've been deprived of the use of it, and we might have to fight over it. So that's violent conflict. Right. So a property rights system emerges among people who prefer cooperation, and it emerges to settle disputes about those resources that we use in action. But you see that's only one part of human action. The other part, again, is the knowledge that you possess. It makes no sense to have property rights for the knowledge because the knowledge is not something people can fight over. My knowledge of how to use a sharp rock to make a spear – tip. My knowledge of how to throw the spear at a fish and kill it 
is knowledge that anyone else can use at the same time. There may be thousands of other people who also know how to do this, or they might have learned it from you, from observing you. Right? The fact that they copied what you did or learned from what you did doesn't take anything from you whatsoever. There's no conflict there. They're not taking the knowledge from you because you still have the knowledge. So this is fundamentally why intellectual property rights um, are incompatible with real property rights because they attempt to assign property rights in the knowledge part of human action mm. as well as in the scarce resources part of human action. But this literally cannot work. Now look, see, I, I personally believe as a libertarian – that patent law and copyright law should be abolished. I think these laws should not be laws. Okay, so that's just a normative position. But I also state as a lawyer and just as an analyst of this kind of a legal system, it is literally impossible to have a property right in an idea. So the copyright system doesn't really grant property rights in ideas. What it really does, and the reason is because all law is based backed up by force. That's physical force. Physical force is always applied to physical things in the world. That is to the scarce resources in the world. So for example, if if um, if a publisher sues a pirate for knocking off uh, one of their author's books, what they really want is the use of force issued by a state court against the, the defendant, which either takes his money from him right, in, term, in the form of damages or maybe puts him in jail even, so puts his body in jail or issues an order from the court compelling him not to print this book using his printing press. So all of these results are always basically the same as, a, a, as the end result of a dispute over those resources. So what you could say is that a copyright is really a transfer of money from one person to another. right? So it's always really – a dispute over a resource. It's just a disguised way of doing it because we call it a property right in ideas, and if you breach that copyright in ideas, then the damages would be a, a payment of money. Right. When really, when really, uh, you could just reword the copyright law, and it could say, uh, everyone owns their money unless someone does the following action, in which case they they have to give their money to someone else. So you see, it's just the basis for an excuse to transfer money. It's really redistribution of wealth, which basically is socialistic. Okay. So it takes it takes property from its legitimate previous natural owner and it transfers it to someone else, just like taxes would do, for example. So in a sense, it's no different than a tax. Okay. So by having Stefan on this program, you're sort of guessing my political leanings. I tend to be libertarian as well. Tend to be. I am a libertarian. Um, okay. So I want to play the role of the ignorant uh, plebe, plebe here because I more or less am. Uh, you said that let's, – let's break down what you just said. So you're saying that the pencil is a extension of myself. It, it allows me to uh, express myself, okay? A lot of people will say, well, that is why we need intellectual property law – in the first place is because, well, my, my song that I just wrote, that is an extension of myself, and it is. Um, but, let, and then, and now let's take what you said later in your, in your argument. The only way that IP law, how do I want to say this? Uh, it, you sort of assume that the content creator has absolutely is completely powerless mm -hmm. to do anything to circumvent this. Like you use the example of J.K. Rowling in another uh, mm -hmm. uh, article that you wrote. And in this example, like J.K. Rowling, she she has – how do I want to – I'm trying to find the right words to say this, but you just have this idea that the content creator is absolutely powerless, and the only way that they can protect – their own uh, content is through this law. But yep. you say that if the content creator it takes some proaction, they can actually uh, flourish in, yes. in, in ways that the IP law prevents them from doing so. 
Yeah. Well, let's say I think I know where you're heading with some of this. So let's go back to the pencil for a second. Okay. My, my argument is not that you have a property right in the pencil because it's, because it's an extension of yourself. What I was trying to explain there is the reason the word property is misused is because uh, we, we come up with the word – I mean the word propriety just means you're the proprietor or owner of something. So – or who's the one who properly should be able to use this thing? So I'm just explaining why the word property has morphed over time and ends up being used to refer to the thing owned itself. Mm -hmm. The reason you have the right to the pencil is not because it's an extension of yourself because you could imagine other extensions of yourself that you don't have a property right to. So for example – or characteristic. so let's – for example, you have a certain weight right now. Yeah. Right, and you have a certain color, maybe, and you have a certain age, right? And you might have a certain style of laughing. There are many characteristics of you that help define what your nature and identity is, but you don't own those characteristics. If you owned your weight, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's 173 pounds. That means you would own everyone else in the world that weighs 173 pounds. So the problem is you can't own universals or characteristics of things. Mm -hmm. So the, it is true the pencil can be considered to be an extension of yourself, and that's why we might say it's, it's your property. It's a property of you. But the reason that you own it is because you have a better claim to it, and it's the type of thing – that can be owned. So one thing I didn't mention was how we assign these property rights. It's not just arbitrary. If we want to have a voluntary society that's cooperative and peaceful and productive and everyone can get along at least possibly, we come up with these property rights to assign the ownership of these possibly disputed things. But those property rights have to be assigned to based upon some fair rules, some kind of objective rules that everyone could recognize as being fair. And those turn out to be only two rules, okay? Um, and creation, by the way, is not one of them, which I'll get to. Those two rules are, number one, if it's an unowned thing just sitting out there, no one's using it, there is no owner of it, like something in the virgin wilderness. If you are the first person to start using it and do it in a demonstrable way where there's property boundaries or borders set up around it, you know, you put a fence up around a little hut. Now you've homesteaded this land. So we call that homesteading or you could call it original appropriation. So the, the first way to come to own a resource is to be the first one to own it when it was previously unowned. The only other way to come to own a resource is to acquire one that's already owned from someone else voluntarily from them. That is by contract or gift or donation. So those are the only two ways to come to own something. Most people think that creation is mixed in with this or is part or is another way of coming to own resources like if you make something you should own it but that and, and then they then they analogize from that they say well if i make a new horseshoe and i own that new horseshoe what if i make a new song why why shouldn't i own the song because you've already agreed that people that make things own them the problem is that's actually not true it is not true that people that make things own them and let me explain why making something just means transforming it or producing a new arrangement of that thing. So to make a horseshoe, I need to have some iron ore first, some metal. I also need to have an anvil and a hammer and a fire and some place to make the horseshoes, right? So I already own some kind of resource like uh, iron ore or whatever you're going to make a horseshoe out of, yeah. okay? So I already own this hunk of metal. I don't know if I found it, I mined it myself, or if I purchased it from someone, but I acquired ownership of this ore. And then I used my labor, my effort, my intellect, my ideas, my time to transform it into something that's better, better for me, maybe better for customers, whatever. When you do that, you increase your wealth because the things you have are more valuable now, but you don't increase your property rights. You don't add new property rights to the world. It's not like you didn't own the horseshoe before, and now you own it. It's like you own this metal arranged in a certain way, and now you still own the metal even though it's arranged in a different way. So creation is actually not a source um, of ownership, and this can also be seen if you imagine uh, a thief or an employee, someone who transforms a resource, the raw materials owned by someone else. So let's say I sneak into your house at night and I take your stash of iron ore 
and I make a bunch of horseshoes out of them. Does that mean I own the horseshoes? No, because I actually am a trespasser, and I you might not have wanted them to become horseshoes. So I, I might actually owe you damages for trespassing on and, and, and ruining your, your iron ore. Um, or if you're an employee working for someone, and look, I have a – I have a horseshoe factory. I have a thousand employees making horseshoes. I'm just paying them a wage to make the horseshoes. That's the deal. They're using my metal, transforming it into horseshoes, which I own. So just because you transform or create something doesn't mean you own it. And in the cases where it does, it's not because you transformed it. It's because you already owned the raw materials that went into it. So this is the reason why the creator of a song doesn't own the song because owning the song would mean owning uh, other people's bodies basically because you could prevent them from singing the song or typing it out on paper. So that's that's one way to look at it. Um, the other thing is if you realize the nature and the history of these rules – I mean look, copyright came about when the printing press started emerging and the ruling classes, you know, the religion, the church and the state started getting nervous. Because before they had control over these scribes, these people that had to hand copy everything one by one, and they had control over this uh, through the church. But now the printing press started threatening this and started threatening to to allow um, mass pr mass printed mass produced works to get out into the hands of the people, even if the church and the state didn't want them to read this stuff, okay, or it wasn't the approved version. So for a few centuries, the state used various me mechanisms to keep control of this. It was a type of thought control or censorship. They, they had the Stationers Company, which is the official printing guild in England. And then when that monopoly that lasted about 100-something years started to expire, by then you had the printing industry had built up, but they were all in cahoots with the state because they, they would only print things the government and the church would allow them to print. And if you had to print a book, you had to go through the the official printing company to do it. So you see the, the government and the church kept control of what books were printed using this mechanism. And when the stationers' company's monopoly started to expire, uh, parliament uh, established the statute of monopolies. I'm sorry, the statute of Anne. Statute of monopolies was uh, how they got patents started. The, the statute of Anne basically started modern copyright. So copyright comes out of the state's and the church's ability to control what could be printed. So you can see that it, the roots of copyright lie in censorship, and you can see that it, ha it, it operates this way today. Imagine you're some artist and you want you – know, you, 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 you write a new poem. You make a new painting. You photograph a certain scene. Even if you photograph it independently and originally, but you stand in the same location that some other photographer did. You take a picture of the same natural items. You could be sued for copyright infringement. If you post a song on YouTube, someone could send a DMCA takedown notice claiming that they own a copyright in some aspect of it, and it will be taken down. So uh, if you have a documentary and you want to produce a documentary… Uh, it's almost impossible to do documentaries now without stripping them of lots of content uh, because you can't get permission from uh, people that have bits and pieces of things you wanted to use in your documentary. So there's a tremendous hampering of artistic freedom under the copyright system. Um, <clears throat> one, one resource that I found very helpful was Against Intellectual Monopoly by Boldrin and Levine, a couple of professors, I believe, in St. Louis, is it? Yes. And um, from what I understand, they set out to disprove what you're saying right now. And they were going to, well, I guess they were going to prove that intellectual property, the whole concept of intellectual property, is legitimate. And they, in their studies, their research, they ended up c completely changing course, completely uh, disagreeing with themselves what what they had at the outset and wrote this book called Against Intellectual Monopoly. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. Let, wow. let me let me put this uh, their work into context. Um, um, the way that some of us, probably yourself and me, would approach these type of issues is from uh, a more of a rights based or a principled approach. So we sometimes talk about what natural human rights are. And this is connected with property rights, and so 
most of the argument I've given is practical, but that's because property is a practical institution. But we're explaining basically that a copyright or a patent basically violates someone's rights because a copyright prevents me from using my property as I see fit. A patent prevents me from using my property as I see fit. So that's a violation of my natural right to property, my natural ownership of my body and myself. That's one way to look at it. Okay. The, the prevailing way that most people nowadays look at things is more um, more pragmatic or utilitarian or consequentialist. You could say basically people look at the effects of laws and they say, well, I mean you and I would say the purpose of law is to do justice, and you do justice by protecting people's rights. You protect people's rights by identifying what those rights are, and all rights are property rights, and they should be identified according to the – the first user principle and contract like I mentioned earlier. So that's sort of the libertarian analytical approach to this. But nowadays everything is sort of uh, uh, all soupy and, and, and not as precise. People say, well, we need a law here because we need this effect. So people say, well, we don't have enough stimulation of the arts, so therefore we need the government to have the National Endowment for the Arts and take some money from some people in the form of taxes and then have a government agency that distributes this money to you know to needy um, artists right who otherwise would not have enough money to engage in their projects so the argument there is there's some optimal amount of artistic production in society and we're below that optimum and the government can use its laws to tweak things to achieve this optimal result and a similar argument is used nowadays for copyright even though copyright arose as a method of censorship and thought control, now its defenders who are entrenched in various industries, right? Uh, they, they use these utilitarian justifications. So the argument for copyright would be that um, if you don't have copyright, then it would be hard for some artist to make money because someone could just knock off their work. And it would be hard for me to license my, my music right, without copyright. Um, now, Bolger and Levine approach it from that point of view. They just are utilitarians who look at look at the law like economists do, and they say, does this law have the optimal effects that it claims or does it not? And they were under the assumption, like everyone else is, that you need copyright and patent. They're like a normal part of a capitalist Western property rights system, and that you need that to stimulate the arts and innovation. Um, maybe we can improve it. Maybe we can tweak it. But let's just do a study. Let's see. We should be able to prove that that the existence of copyright and patent have benefited society enormously. We should be able to show this. So they started doing empirical studies, looking for evidence, looking for examples, looking for data. And over time, they both realized, oh my god, <laughs> patent and copyright actually deter innovation, and they distort the cultural – fields, and they hamper innovation, and they reduce the content, and they cause bullying, <laughs> and they extract money from consumers, and X, Y, Z. So they basically concluded in their book that copyright and patent should basically – they're not quite as radical and libertarian as you and I are, but they, they ultimately conclude that patent and copyright do not do what they're claimed to do and that we'd be better off without them. Mm. Man. Well, we mentioned earlier – uh, J.K. Rowling, and I want to talk a little bit about practical application of how musicians, musicpreneurs can work um, within the system in which we are currently. And um, I was just about to say something. Well, well, let's get. Well, I, I could take off from what you just said, though. I like I like your expression, musicpreneur, because it recognizes the entrepreneurial aspect right of and and what i okay i got it what Go i was ahead. saying is that people who are still listening to this there i i'm gonna assume that you're into what we're saying may not totally agree quite yet may you probably want to listen to this again i'm gonna have several uh resources for you to read more about it but i'm, I'm gonna assume that people still listening to this they want to they're here because they want to make some money with their music and i want to talk about how can we uh, work within the system that we're currently in? Uh, yes. Because copyright, it's, it's good if you are a major publishing source, not so good if you're an independent. So what are some avenues that people can 
uh, pursue so that they can ensure maximum exposure for their music, uh, but at the same time protect their integrity? Yeah, and then here's where um, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, advice and things I've I've seen and come up with, you know, half of it is my lawyer hat and what I've what I've seen assisting clients and and talking to people who are creators of different types. Um, we have we have to separate patents and copyright. And let's stick with copyright here. Pat, the way you respond to the patent system is different than the way you respond to the copyright system. Um, my view is that 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 patents damage us materially more than copyrights do. My my estimates, you know, patents probably cost us a trillion dollars or more a year in lost innovation and costs on a world on a worldwide basis. Um, copyrights don't cause as much, say, measurable uh, uh, material harm, but I think copyright is even worse than patents because. Uh, number one, the terms last a lot longer. They last over a hundred years in most cases, um, and it's it's being used it's used uh, by copyright bullies and by states to restrict like internet freedom. If you remember, SOPA almost passed a couple years ago, mm-hmm. and it's, it's probably going to pass in some form eventually, in piecemeal form. In fact, the uh, the uh, What's the treaty that was a the TT uh, TTP that uh, Trump is apparently against and Hillary claimed to be against at the last minute had some SOPA like provisions in it which would have put them into a treaty with like uh, countries that amounted to forty percent of the world. SOPA GDP. is uh, remind me SOPA. Oh, that was the, sorry that was a Stop Online Piracy Act oh, right. and that would have been a, a federal law that made it much easier for companies to basically kick you off the internet for life <laughs> yeah. as a punishment for engaging in piracy so it would it basically restricts internet freedom or take people's websites down if there's an allegation of copyright infringement so basically uh it, in the name of copyright which is allegedly a property right of creators um you have you have this being used as an excuse by the state to increase state control and big corporate control of the internet and restrict internet freedom, which is very dangerous, of course. Um, so the point is, copyright. The good thing about copyright is that you don't have to participate in the system. Uh, you you do get a copyright automatically. You can't help it under federal law and international law. As soon as you produce any kind of creative work, you have a copyright. But you don't have to register it. You don't have to enforce it. And in fact, you can you can use Creative Commons licenses or other mechanisms. In, in the field of software, you can use the software type licenses, and you can participate in a system of open open sourcing things. And I really think. And the other thing you can do is try to re, try not to deal with, try not to assign your copyrights away to a to a music studio or or one of these publishers because uh, then you lose control of it. Okay, and then they're going to use it like bullies, and they're going to charge crazy prices for your book. They're going to make it hard for your name to get out there because piracy is going to be more, more limited. So unless you're really in it solely for the money right now and you have the capacity to make so much money as a legit, uh, as a regular sort of a mainstream artist that even getting only 15 percent of the royalties because the movie – I mean the music studios and the, and the book publishers are going to take the, the bulk of it, right? Um, then I think you're better off being independent. So my next book I'm going to self-publish. I'm not going to go through a publisher because they're going to – it would delay me by a year. They're going to insist on some changes, which I don't want to make, right? And then they're going to publish it for way higher a price than I want to. They're not going to consent to me putting a free PDF online, let's say, for marketing purposes or to get my name out there. Um, there's just so much liberty and freedom that you have, and especially with the technology now, right? I mean, we yes. all have heard these stories of these guys that are publishing. Um, well, if you talk about music itself, of course, I think we all know by now that a, a lot of musicians make their money from gigs, right? From mm-hmm. from, from concerts. But no, who's going to pay you to do a gig or for a concert if they've never heard of you? I mean, it's going to be a smaller deal. So I, I mean, m- most concerts I go to the Musicians have a stack of CDs, and yeah, they're selling them. I don't think they're making their money off the CD. Sometimes they give them away. They want people to know their music, mm-hmm. right? So I think it was Cory Doctorow, a science fiction author, who said uh, uh, the real the real danger that 
you know a budding artist faces is not piracy it's obscurity you know so <laughs> it, it just makes no sense to try to restrict a budding fan base so of course these are practical things that you can do you could also be careful not to you know assign away your works unknowingly um and then there are practical things you can do you can you can use open source music as sort of backgrounds in your podcast and things like that instead of using you know a 20 second cut from a from a popular artist risking getting shut down or sued by their by their studio etc yeah the music that i use for this podcast i just i know the guy that produced it and i just sent him a message and said hey can i use your your song for my podcast he said sure no no problem (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, one interesting thought experiment, it's a little bit um, on a tangent here, but it, at the present time, you can just use public domain work, which is basically work that's, say, more than 70 years old. So a lot of times people use old cartoons and old advertisements and old book manuscripts and classical music from 100 plus years ago because they know that that's safe, right? Right. It, in a way, this distorts the culture because we have the last 50 years' worth of stuff is like not on the shelf of the tools you can use. So it distorts the culture a little bit. But imagine the world in 10,000 years. Okay, Let's just go way into the future. The body, the body of human artistic output that is going to exist on PETA drives you know, in people's pockets – it's going to be immense, and even if we still have copyright law, which blocks the last 70, 70 years of music, you're going to have 10,000 more years of great music to draw from. So like 99.9% of all human uh, artistic output would be available in the public domain, and so it won't be as big of a barrier to creative freedom in 10,000 years right. just because the fraction of new stuff will be so much smaller. <laughs> you know, um, I – when I started this business, Musicpreneur, I registered the word Musicpreneur along with the tagline, Making Money, Making Music. And I didn't do that because I wanted to prevent anyone else from using that word. If anything, the more people that use it, the better it is for me because that's the name of my business. And more brand recognition, the better as far as I'm concerned. But the reason that I registered it and I put in the paperwork in July, here it is January, still haven't heard from the government they move at their own special speed but that's another story but the reason that I did it is because I didn't want someone else to uh, profit off of my success and what I mean by that is let's say that this business takes off and it's worth five million dollars two years from now three years from now whatever someone could register the word musicpreneur and then contact me and say hey you can't use that word anymore if you want to use it you have to pay me $70,000 $70,000 a year or a month or something. And yes, and, and, and now you're getting to – when you say register, you're talking about trademark, which is yet another type of intellectual property right, which we haven't yeah, even touched trademark. on. Well, maybe mm-hmm. maybe That's we'll talk trademark. about that in the future. Yeah, we can, and I can just say uh, briefly here that uh, I'm opposed to trademark as well, mm-hmm. but for other reasons. Okay. Um, uh, I think in today's climate, it makes total sense to register your trademark, but again, what you can do with that is – um, trademark is a little bit different than copyright and patent. You don't have to enforce a patent or a copyright, but trademark has the feature where if you don't enforce it, then you could lose it over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then again, you're facing the danger that you think you might face like, before, which is someone else might register that as a trademark and then prevent you from using your own name. So what you can do is trademark it, and then whenever you see someone else using it, you just send them a letter and you say – you're using my trademark. I'm happy to give you permission to do so for a dollar a year. Yeah. You know, or so, or some <laughs> marginal fee so that you have an official license. They recognize right. your trademark, but they're in the clear. You're not threatening them, and you keep your trademark alive that way. So there are little tips and tricks like that that you can uh, you can do to navigate within the existing system. Right. Well, you know, your the Austrian system of economics. And um, I know I know that this is a music podcast, but you know we're entrepreneurs too, so you have to understand the the way things work with uh, economics as well. So that's why I want to, and that's why I'm not bashful about having uh, Stefan Kinsella on here to because you, you just have to understand the world if you want to be an entrepreneur. But um, uh, the the system of property that you're describing that's very much in the tradition of John Locke. Uh, versus like a uh, 
uh, Hobbes. What's it? Thomas Hobbes. So, where where do you think the um, the philosophy behind this intellectual property comes from? It's not definitely not John Locke and the founding of America. That type of where where well, does it have its foundation? Well, I think the the historical foundation is uh, in for copyright was really in this thought control censorship, um, and in patents it was more protectionism, like the the, the king granting a monopoly mm-hmm. uh, to one of his cronies in a given town, like the only guy who could export sheepskin or something. So he just did that to get loyalty from this guy, and maybe the guy would give him some kickbacks, help him collect taxes, things like that. But something um, that uh, Boldrin and, and Levine were saying, they said that uh, England had these copyright laws, but then English, British authors would sell their books in the U.S. or in the colonies where there was no law, and they would flourish, whereas in Britain they didn't do as well. Well, yeah, the, uh, what what happened was... Uh, uh, well, now we have more of an internationalist system where we have these treaties like the Berne Convention. Mm. So all these countries, most of the countries in the world agree to abide by certain minimum standards, but um, which is how the U.S. and the copyright, uh, the, the music industry, Hollywood and the software industry have sort of – and, the, and the, the, the pharmaceutical industry especially have exported our copyright and patent laws to the rest of the world at, for the benefit of big American corporations. But – uh, in the beginning, in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in the beginning of the UN- United States, we had a copyright and a patent system, but there were no international r- treaties. And so we had copyright here, but it didn't extend to foreign authors. So uh, some foreign author like Charles Dickens, would, he could his, – his book could be knocked off in the US because he was a foreign author. But it turned out that they did better in markets over here than local authors did because their works were easy to knock off and spread, and they became popular, and they gave speaking tours and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And musicians these days, they shouldn't be worried about people knocking off their music. It's If anything, it's help, it helps bolster their brand. It helps them sell well, hats and I, so tickets. I would, I, would, I would look at it like this. In, yeah. a, in, a, cop, in a copyright-free world... People can copy your stuff without your permission, but they can do that now. I mean there is piracy going on, right? So yeah. we, we've reached a point where it's not going to ever get harder to copy things. The internet's the world's biggest copying machine, right. and it's only going to get easier from here on out to copy. So our, all authors of works that are easy to copy, uh, someone who makes a movie, someone who do, does photography, a painting, writes novels, whatever, um, they're, they face – they face the fact that it's easy for people to copy what they're doing. So that's a fact. No matter how draconian we make the laws trying to make a few examples out of the few people that we can catch, that's that's happening. So they have to face that reality already. Right. Um, you know, I would say that in, uh, in, in a world – look, artists thrive on freedom. They're about freedom. They should be for freedom. They should be for justice, right? And – just as they have learned from others and always will learn from others and borrow from others, they're part of an incremental process. They've added their small piece to advance whatever they're doing in their field, but they stand on the shoulders of others, and mm-hmm. others are going to stand on their shoulders. This is part of the uh, you know the way the world works. I would also say this. Look, an entrepreneur is someone who sees some kind of gap in the market or some kind of way to make money. He invests his time and resources hoping to make a profit. Now, in a sense, this is an economics uh, insight. Profit is an unnatural thing. In other words, the more profit you're making, the more you're going to attract competitors, and they're going to come Mm -hmm. in and start competing with you and whittle your profit away down to basically the natural rate of interest in society. So profit is always an unnatural thing that happens because an entrepreneur spots some anomaly in the market that he can temporarily exploit. So every entrepreneur in the world faces the prospect of competition. They just try to become better or have a better reputation or get there first. So as a simple example, if you know, if I notice there's this craze of, of taco restaurants spreading around the country, right? Like up until now it's been pizza and hamburgers, but <laughs> notice that, you know, hey, Arizona, they really like those tacos there. So I start a little chain of taco restaurants in in, in Texas, let's say, and they're popular. Now, I might be the first one, and I can charge a lot for the tacos at first, but soon you know, someone down the street who's looking for a way to park their money or something to do, they're going to say, well, 
I'll start Joe's taco stand, and I'll start competing with this guy, and they start taking some of the business away. So it's only a matter of time before there's lots of them, and it's harder for the original guy to make the same profit he used to. So he's got to keep innovating, or, or maybe he goes out of business eventually. right? So you have McDonald's and Burger King in the hamburger industry, and you have Taco Bell and Taco Cabana and <laughs> others in the taco industry. The point is every entrepreneur faces the challenge of figuring out how to make a profit even though he's going to eventually face competition. So in abstract terms, that's exactly the situation of some musician who wants to profit from their work. The only difference is one of degree, not of kind. That is, it seems to them like it's easier for people to compete because their product is purely digital and easy to copy. Unlike a taco stand where you have to buy a building and it might take a few years to get some investors and build the you know hire some employees and start making competing tacos, so it's not as easy to compete in certain fields where the a key aspect of the product is a an easily copyable pattern of information on a disk, and as I said, with the internet and with digital technology and with mass storage becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, copying is just very, very easy now right um so what that means is it's simply easier for people to compete with you in certain fields if you have a certain business model. So all this means is it's up to the musical entrepreneur to recognize this and to try to find a way to make a profit despite the fact that he's going to have competition. Hmm. So, you know, you can you can sing at a concert, and that's not something anyone else can do. If you're famous for a given it with a given group of fans, you are the only one they want to hear. Right. right, so you can charge you can charge a reasonable amount for a concert or for a bar mitzvah or to <laughs> to to make a song for someone you know for their kid's birthday. I don't know, <laughs> help them do a music video like Rebecca Black. Yeah, love so, Rebecca Black. So, yeah, so the point is, it's not the job of the law, and it's not the job of economists either to tell entrepreneurs how to make money. We 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 that's the entrepreneur's job. They have to be aware of the. Of the of how different business models can be easily copied or competed with, and take that into account. And, and some business models might not be viable because they're just too they're, they're, it's too hard to maintain a profit. But that's always been true in human history. Hmm. Well, Stefan, we're running short on time, and uh, but uh, I want to close with just a couple of thoughts from you. We you mentioned earlier ten thousand years. Imagine the world ten thousand years from now. It's maybe a little <laughs> difficult to do that. But I'd like to imagine it, you're well versed in this and, and judging on what you've seen in the past. Where do you see the world in ten years from now in the realm of intellectual property? Um, I don't see any any uh, statutory or legal progress mm -hmm. that's significant in patents or copyrights coming anytime soon, and that's because the interests are so entrenched. Mm. Uh, but the good thing is it's becoming easier and easier to get around these laws. So gotcha. in the field of copyright, number one, like I said, it's it's so – it's getting easier and easier to pirate, and that is putting a lot of pressure on publishers to act more like they would have to act in a free market anyway. Mm. Uh, it's also getting easier to encrypt things so that you're not going to be caught as easily, right, to use uh, VPNs for your, sure. your dial-up so that you don't get caught torrenting as, as easily. Uh, and also the spread of the uh, – in the software field, we saw this earlier. We saw that um, – I'm not really – I don't really know what percentage, but I would guess maybe half of the software in the U.S., let's say, is probably generated by some kind of uh, uh, open model. Mm -hmm. I mean it's, it's not trivial. It's a lot. It could be right. even more than half. Um, that has led to the, the widespread sort of basically doing an end run around copyright. Uh, without copyright, the model would still be different. You wouldn't need a license at all, but it, you're, you're emulating more what a copyright-free system would look like. Now, in the field of books and music, I think you're seeing in the last 10 or 15 years a similar phenomenon slowly starting to happen with the increasing use of Creative Commons to sort of partly open up your works, your, your photographs, uh, people's paintings, you know, uh, uh, and the rise of self-publishing, which helps mm. get around this – the publishing industry and the gatekeepers, which really are a relic of the the old censorship and copyright system. So I think the, the publishing industries are going to start kind of 
crumbling more and more, and you're going to have more and more independent artists. So that's – I see copyright becoming more and more irrelevant because few and few people choose to use it, and more people can get around it and yeah. evade it. Well, I put a note saying forcing the establishment to act like entrepreneurs. I love that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, Stefan – is it stephankinsella.com is the yes. website. Uh, great read if you are interested at all in what he said. I promise that I didn't get any, I didn't understand more than 40%. I have to listen to this again myself. Uh, so it's not something that you can just listen to and, and understand in one take. It, it takes, in some cases, many, many years to really uh, grasp what we're talking about here. So, um, Stefan, I want to say thank you for being on the show. Um, hopefully we can do it again if people have some questions that they wanted some clarification on, but, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks again. You're welcome. Happy to do it. The show notes for this episode can be found at musicpreneur.com slash IP. Very easy to remember, musicpreneur.com slash IP. It's going to have a outline of the conversation with Stefan Kinsella and myself. And I'm also going to make the PDF, uh, Doing Business Without Intellectual Property, available right there on that show notes page. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that um, it at least gave you a bit of a balanced perspective on this topic. I learned quite a bit just listening to Stefan in this interview, and, I had, and I've studied this topic for several years now. So there's always something to learn. And um, you know what? If you have questions, if, if you need clarification on something that Stefan said, send me an email. Send him an email. He responds to, he responds to every email I've sent him, so I don't see any reason why he wouldn't respond to you. I'll just say that you heard... Uh, his interview on this podcast and he is more than happy to share his knowledge and provide any clarification so I don't know if, if there's enough questions then maybe we can have him back on and do a little Q&A on the topic of intellectual property so that does it for today I've got an exciting announcement that I'm going to share on this Friday's episode it's not quite ready for public consumption yet but come this Friday, it's going to be uh, ready to go, and it involves um, a free ebook for you, and even an opportunity for you to make a little money as an affiliate with a product. So this is James Newcomb signing off. Thank you for listening, and look forward to seeing you next time.